<laughs> you know, we got video now of how many people take donuts and go out the back door and they never do a study at all. So. This is Calvary Chapel. Calvary Chapel, yes. That's correct. That's funny. I did refuge, refuge on Sunday. Nice. All right. Well, it's good to see everybody again. And uh, as you know, we're in uh, chapter, the end of chapter eight. We didn't get through all of chapter eight. So we'll conclude that and see how far we get through chapter nine this evening. And, um, you know, we've had a lot of attention paid to the temple. We've had a lot of attention paid to the building of Solomon's house. And... <clears throat> And uh, this relationship with King Hiram that we're going to see some more of tonight. And so uh, as we're digging through all this building stuff, it's amazing that if you really look how much meat there is in the midst of something that, honestly, if I was reading chapter by chapter in the morning, I'd be tempted just to maybe skip these couple chapters, you know, quite frankly. So uh, I didn't say that really, but... Um, <laughs> But it can be difficult, but when you really stop and look, you realize God is trying to say some things, and there's some doctrines and principles of Scripture that we should know that are found in these uh, very uh, sections. So we're going to start in verse 54 of chapter 8, and see how far the Lord allows us to go uh, tonight from there. So let's pray to Him and ask Him to uh, really be with us and bless our study. Father God, it's in Jesus' name that we gather here tonight. Lord, it's in your name that we open our Bible and uh, study it and read what you have to say. So God, we pray that nothing less than your will be done in all of our lives. Lord, may your word be rich and true and help me, Lord, to, uh, to teach it in a way that honors you and honors your name. And all these things now we pray through Christ our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Okay. Uh, 1 Kings 8, 54, we read, And so it was, when Solomon had finished praying all this, all this prayer and supplication to the Lord, that he arose from before the altar of the Lord, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread up to heaven. Then he stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses. So let's stop there for a second. What a wonderful thing to be able to celebrate, to be able to say not one word has failed. So <clears throat> when God speaks, he speaks in the terms of thus saith the Lord, correct? Which pretty much means you can put all your eggs in that basket. It's going to happen, right? There's no possibility for it not to happen. So it's the surety and the certainty of the Word of God. Now, we teach things in Bible classes like the plenary, inerrant, infallible Word of God. And that's a fancy way of saying it's not only without error, it's not capable of error, and in all of its fullness to every word of the original author is inspired by God. Now... What I marvel at is Jesus himself sets a standard for the authority of Scripture, and it's higher than what all these smart scholars try to tell us the Scriptures are. The smart scholars say, listen, it's plenary, full, uh, infallible, not capable of error, inerrant, so it has no errors. Um, word of God. Jesus says... Not one jot or tittle will by no means pass away before all is fulfilled. So he's not saying every word is inspired. He's saying every jot. The jot is the smallest Hebrew letter in the whole alphabet. Uh, it's half the size of any other letter in the alphabet. He says the smallest letter and the tittle was the smallest stroke of the Hebrew pen. So it's kind of like crossing a T would be a tittle. And he's saying not one of the smallest letters or the smallest strokes of the Hebrew pen will fail to come to pass. So it's not every word is inspired. He said, I inspired every stroke of their pen. So that allows somebody like Solomon to say not one word of all his good promise, which he promised through his servant Moses, has failed. 
It's all come to be. Now, keep that in mind when we get a little further in the text. 57, may the Lord our God be with us as he was with our fathers. May he not leave us nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to himself to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, which he commanded our fathers. Now, <clears throat> interesting language, okay? Again, I always encourage you guys to read slow and careful, right? There's so much there that we miss if we don't. To me, verse 58, is a little, would, I would expect it to come out a little bit differently than this. I would expect it to say something like um, that his heart might be inclined to us, like he might have compassion or pity on us. But this is saying that he may incline our hearts to him, that he actually has this, this, this sway over our hearts, that he wants to incline our hearts to himself. Now, why I point that out is because it reminds me of the language of Philippians 2.13, which says that God works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. God works in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. So I think we kind of get the concept of he works in us to do for his good pleasure, but it actually says he also works in us to will it. He's working us, creating a want to in us, that we want to serve him. And so when we talk about the battle between faith and works, um, the Bible is clearly telling us that works are never absent from true faith. They are not an ingredient for your faith, but they are never absent from true faith, ever. So that's why right after the huge you're saved by grace through faith alone, not of works, so nobody can boast verse. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, verse 10 will say, For you are Christ's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared beforehand for you to walk in. So there, can't be any clearer. Saved by grace through faith alone, not of works. But he's prepared works for you to do. So you have your faith. You have a series of works. When you receive Christ, they marry each other. They become one in you faith and works and um, and as this says in verse 58 he's inclining your heart to himself in other words do any of you have any different desires after salvation than you had before salvation or have you lost some desires that you had before salvation you no longer desire after salvation okay did things change a bit in the heart area okay that's him um, working in you to willing to do for his good pleasure that's him inclining your heart to himself. And so people will then say, when they get that concept, they'll say, well, where's my freedom then? Where's my freedom once I get saved? Now he's inclining my heart to him. That's not my free will. But what that misses, and this I'll bring up a little later as well, what that misses is this. When God creates you, he creates you just like a man creates a car. There's a certain way a car is gonna operate to its full potential and all of that if you follow the owner's manual if you care for it the way you're supposed to, if you give it the gas and oil in timely ways and good ingredients and things like that, that car will be the best car it could possibly be for you. God created you the same way. There's a certain way that you will be the best version of yourself, that you will operate to the highest capacities that you can operate. And that you're gonna find that when you're absolutely, totally, uncompromisingly obedient to the word of God, because that's how you're made. So if a car had a personality, it could say, well, I want to have whatever gas I want. I want to have oil, whatever I want and everything. But would it be the best version of that car it could possibly be? No. It has to be obedient to how the designer designed it. Just like you have to be obedient to how the designer designed you. And that makes the best version of yourself. So here uh, uh, Solomon's celebrating the fact that God is with us, just like he's with our fathers. He's not going to leave us nor forsake us. Why? So that he may incline our hearts to himself. Is that a lack of your freedom? No. It's a position where you can actually operate full capacity. Outside of Christ, you can't operate full capacity. In fact, the Bible will say, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Absolutely impossible to please the Lord without faith. So, moving on, 59. And these words of mine, which I have made supplication before the Lord, be near the Lord our God day and night, 
that he may maintain the cause of his servants and the cause of his people Israel as each day may require, that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, there is no other. Let your heart therefore be loyal to the Lord our God to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as, it, as at this day. Now, first of all, God is being seen here as a God who, through our prayers, through our worship, is a God who draws near. God is a God who draws near. When we pray, he's inclining his ear towards us. It's this picture of God bending down to listen, bending down to hear, giving you his ear when you pray. And it's an idea of drawing closer to his people. And why I bring that up is because it's not going to be, it's going to be about a thousand years after this that people are going to be told that God has actually become a man who was actually born into the world. And one of the major, major reactions people had was God would never do that. Right? That's the whole religion of Islam, right? God would never become a man. In fact, when we were at the Dome of the Rock, the, ent the major entrance to the Dome of the Rock, above the door, written in Arabic, was God has no son. So um, it's this belief that God would never deal with human flesh. He would never become human flesh. So, um, but you see this invitation of God encouraging prayer. I said last week that here in these chapters, if there's anything central and, and so important in these chapters, I would say it's you're seeing prayer become more centralized than sacrifice. Now they're getting this temple and God is induct, inducting prayer as the primary means of worship, even over sacrifice. And so we talk about what's the new sacrifice starting when the temple is built. It's a sacrifice of praise. They still sacrifice animals, but what's becoming centralized is the sacrifice of our lips, a sacrifice of praise to him, as uh, Hebrews 13, 15 calls it, um, that we submit ourselves to him with a sacrifice of praise. Let me make sure I'm wording that correctly. Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him being Jesus, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Giving thanks to his name. Giving thanks. You've heard me say repeatedly since we started the study about thankful hearts. Okay. Um, I, I carry that on to my students all the time. Just encouraging them to count their blessings. Thankful hearts. So a kid asked me today, what would you say to a third world, um, like a delete in India that live in sewer drain pipes and, and by their understanding of karma and religion and all of that, that's where they belong because they were not good people in the past. And so now their karma makes them this lowest level of human being. And you're not even to help them because if you help them, you're ruining the karma type of thing. And they just have to live well in that low state so they can advance in the next life and so forth. And I said, surprisingly, I'm going to tell them the same stuff I tell you guys all the time because truth is truth, right? It doesn't matter who you're speaking to. And um, what I'd say is they, they're asking me, could you encourage them to have a thankful heart? I'd say, absolutely, listen. If you're living in a sewer pipe and you can't get out based on your culture, worldview, and all that stuff, then how good is the news that you can live in heaven forever in streets of gold in total glory? Will that help, help your days in the, in the sewer? More than anything, right? Isn't that the number one thought you could carry as you're living those ways? Absolutely. So... Is there something to be thankful for? Yeah. Thank you, God. This isn't all there is. Thank you that I wasn't some awful thing that's making me live here now. This is just the sin of the world making me live here now. And thank you, you've redeemed the sin of the world. And, and you lift me up. And you say I matter. You say I count. You say I'm worth dying for. You say you love me when nobody else will. What do you mean, what would I say to them? I mean, for heaven's sake. But anyways, I didn't say that to them. But... Uh, <clears throat> Now, I can't read this part of verse 60 uh, without going to Isaiah 45 because I love this when it says that all the peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no other. Listen, uh, as Diana will tell you, I don't like shopping. You know, I, when I go to the, if I go to the store, when I go to the store, 
I already know exactly what I'm getting. That's all that I'm getting, and I'm getting out of there as soon as I got it. Okay? Yes. <laughs> I don't shop. I don't make up my mind once I'm there. I don't even go unless I know I need something. So now I need something, I go, I get those very things, and I get out. Okay? Um, we won't describe the other ways it happens. But um, now, so I love when God says that I'm the Lord and there is no other. I don't have to shop for a God, do I? I'm glad I have no other options. I'm glad there's no credibility in these other things. And that's why apologetics is such a wonderful thing to study. Because you realize if I weren't a Christian, I'd become one just overlooking at science or logic or philosophy or reasoning or any of these avenues. I'd be a Christian for all those reasons. You know, much less just uh, thankfully God revealing himself to my heart. But God, God see, wants to make the point over and over again because as John Calvin said, human minds are idol factories. We're always creating idols in our mind. Things to worship, things to admire that all of a sudden we go, oh yeah, God, almost forgot about him. But that thing had your full attention. Okay, that's being an idol factory. Now, um, let's, let's sp spend a little bit of time in Isaiah 45 and hear the heart of God about this. So, I'll start in verse 4. Wow. Try not to read the whole thing, but I'll start in verse 4. And just listen to this. Um, Isaiah 45, 4. I am the Lord and there is no other. Okay, so we start off right with the very same sentence, right? There is no God besides me. I will gird you though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Rain down, you heavens, from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, and let them bring forth salvation, and let the righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Don't you see that in the world? There's just an unsettled spirit with those who strive with their maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or shall the handiwork say he has no hands? Woe to him who says to his father, what are you begetting? Or to the woman, what have you brought forth? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and his maker. Ask me of things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands you command me. I have made the earth and created man on it. I, my hands, stretched out the heavens. Do you know nobody... Well, for 2,300 more years, nobody will know the universe is expanding. But look what Isaiah says, 2,300 years before we figure it out. The heavens are stretched out, right? That's an expanding universe. We found that out in the early 1900s. Isaiah wrote this in the 800s BC. Anyway, let that sink in. And all their host I have commanded. I have raised him up in righteousness, and I will direct all his ways. He shall build my city and let my exiles go free. Not for price nor reward, says the Lord of hosts. Thus says the Lord. Wait, let me see. How much are you going to read these? Yeah, let's keep going. The labor of Egypt and merchandise of Cush and the Sabians, men of stature, shall come over to you and they shall be yours. They shall walk behind you. They shall come over in chains. They shall bow down to you. They will make supplication to you saying, surely God is in you and there is no other. There is no other God. Um... <clears throat> Go to 18. For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. There's another big argument that's out there is, if God is real, why is there so much wasted space out there? You know, we are a speck of specks of specks when you look at the universe. You would never find the earth if, you would never find the Milky Way if you were just randomly put somewhere in the universe. Okay, it's a speck of a speck of a speck. And so people say, why does God waste so much space? Which I would say simply this. He told us in the Bible what he did. He said, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. In other words, if you think the universe is big, what about its maker? It's declaring his glory. Um, and, and, and this says he didn't create the earth in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. Now, 
Do you know at the slightest indication of a molecule on Mars, every newspaper is going to report it. It's going to be on the news. They found a molecule on Mars, a water molecule. That means life maybe and all that stuff. And then within two weeks, nobody ever hears of it again. It all goes away and there's never anything speaking of it again. And when we look at satellite photos of Jupiter, Saturn, Mars, wherever, everywhere we look in the universe, all we see is lifelessness. There's no life anywhere. But this place is teeming with life. You can't look in the waters of the earth without tons of life or on the land of the earth and tons of life. You look in the air above the land filled with life. There's just life everywhere. And this says he did not form the earth in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. And I wish it said this because it's kind of the theme of the chapter and no other. There's no other place he formed to be inhabited. This is the one. Why, if, if, if there's no mind behind the Big Bang, then why did all the life land on this place and none of it anywhere else? And why is life so highly dependent on other things? In other words, we can't have life unless we have water. They think they find a water molecule somewhere else. It's news, and then it turns out not to be a water molecule. But this place is mostly water. And it's peas and, 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 and celery and carrots that we need. How did that happen? Why didn't that stuff land somewhere else? You know, why is everything needed all in the same speck of a speck of a speck when our Bible says he isn't created in vain, he claims he formed it to be inhabited. He says, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. Listen, this is your accountability for being saved. He says, I didn't, I didn't speak this stuff in secret. Not, I didn't say it in a dark place of the earth. I didn't say to the seed of Jacob, seek me in vain. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come. Draw near together. You who have escaped from the nations, they have no knowledge, who carry the wood of their carved image. That's their idol. And they pray to a God that cannot save. Tell and bring forth your case. Yes, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient times? Who told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord, and there is no other God besides me a just God and a savior. There is none besides me. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. I have sworn by myself. I love his predicament of he can't swear to anything else. It's like, what's he gonna swear to? So, you know, he puts his hand on the Bible, says, uh, I swear to tell the truth, so help me me, you know. <laughs> he says, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out from my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. Listen to this now. This might be familiar to you. That to me, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. To who? To the Lord and there is no other. Okay. Philippians chapter two. Watch this now. I didn't know I was going to go there, so I'm going to lose my spots here. That's okay. You guys are worth it. All right. Listen, how many times in Isaiah 45 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. And then he says, and to me, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Philippians 2, starting in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. See, that's not surprising when you realize Solomon's talking about a God who draws near. Remember that? He's always drawing near. So incarnation is just the next step in that. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Listen, Isaiah 45, I'm the Lord, there is no other and I declare that to me every knee will bow and every tongue confess. Then Paul points at Jesus and says to him, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Meaning Jesus has to be the God of Isaiah, correct? Amen. He's the God of Isaiah 45 and it says, I am the Lord and there is no other. So now we have God the Father, I'm the Lord, there is no other. Jesus Christ, uh, I'm the Lord, there is no other. To me, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Then you get to Jesus Christ, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Meaning, meaning he's the Lord and there is no other. 
meaning Jesus is the Father. You see this Trinity? He's with God and he is God. Okay, John 1. Okay. The Bible has no apologies for the, this Trinitarian theology here. It's, it's, there's no other way to understand this stuff correctly. All right. <clears throat> so, as you see again, um, uh, verse 60, he says that the earth may know that the Lord is God and there is no other. Um, it brings something else to mind, a little more of a sidetrack, but that's okay. Anyway, I'm not getting paid for this. So. <laughs> <coughs> that wasn't meant to be out loud in the microphone. But anyway, uh, <laughs> um, listen. I love when Jesus challenges the 12 and dares them to leave him. He dares them in John 6. He starts saying he's the bread of life that came out of heaven. And unless you eat his flesh and drink his blood, you have no life in you. People start saying that's a hard saying. Who could possibly eat his flesh and drink his blood? And in John 6, 66, as many people started walking away from him and leaving him. And Jesus doesn't chase after them. He doesn't say, let, let me try to explain myself. He's trying to see who is in this Christian walk for who he is, no matter how confusing he can get at times. So he's testing them because then he looks at the 12 as people are leaving him. That's not a good church planning strategy, is it? Okay. But he's watching them walk away. He looks at his 12 and says, do you want to leave me too? And Peter says, where are we to go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. You know what that sounds like? Where are we to go, the Lord? Lord, you're the Lord and there is no other. You see this theme, okay? Um, that's what I tell kids when they go to college. You want to walk away from the Lord. My question is this, where are you to go? When you leave Jesus Christ, where are you going to go? There's nothing for you if you walk away from him. All right, uh, 61. Let your heart, therefore, be loyal to the Lord our God, to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments as it is this day. Okay, to walk in his statutes, to keep his commandments. Listen, we have grown to not like language like that. But when you hear walk in his statutes, keep his commandments, you have to hear that that's how you operate best. He's trying to invite you to be fully functional by being attached to him. Disobedience, he cannot draw near. Okay, his drawing near is going to be in your prayer life and in your obedience, your worship. Those are the areas he draws near. That's going to make the best you, both in this life and the next life. 62, then the king and all Israel with him offered sacrifices before the Lord. And Solomon offered a sacrifice of peace offerings, which he offered to the Lord, 22,000 bulls and 120,000 sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of the Lord. On the same day, the king consecrated the middle of the court that was in front of the house of the Lord. For there he offered burnt offerings, grain offerings, and fat, the fat of the peace offerings, because the bronze altar that was before the Lord was too small to receive the burnt offerings and grain offerings and the fat of the peace offerings. Now, uh, that's talking about sacrifice. We were talking about prayer before. I have a little quote that I'd like to share with you because um, how many of you ever like knelt in prayer and just felt like, I don't even know what to say. I'm stuck. I don't even know what to say or what, you know. Um, listen to this. You probably want to write this down because this is very helpful when, when you're, you, you feel like I, have not, I, I don't even know what to say to the Lord. It's, it is better in prayer to have a heart without words than to have words without a heart. Okay? It is better in prayer to have a heart without words than to have words without a heart. Do you know it's okay just to, to sit there? You know, let's say, just sit there. Lord, I just want to be with you. I don't know what to say. I just want to be with you. And, um, and I, again, I think if you just start any prayer with the word thank you, all of a sudden you'll start realizing, I can say for this and for that. There's so many things I can, I can be thankful for. All right. I like that quote. I thought you might like that quote. Okay. <laughs> All right, 65. At that time, Solomon held a feast and all Israel with him, a great assembly from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt. 
before the Lord our God, seven days and seven more days, 14 days. On the eighth day, he sent the people away and blessed the, and they blessed the king and went to their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the good that the Lord had done for his servant David and for Israel, his people. Now, it's not going to be very long at all that they, they're going to go from this high, joyful place. Everybody's feasting. Everybody's celebrating. This glorious temple that's a wonder of the world is just good, is, is a magnificent temple that Solomon has built. Uh, they're no longer wanderers. They're no longer conquerors where they got to take over land. They're now settled. They're in their land. Their temple is built. Now they can enjoy their God. <clears throat> and it's not going to be long before everything goes south. So what I want to say about that is this. Life gets really hard when we fail to remember the moments when we're close to God. Life gets really hard when we fail to remember the moments when we're close to God. The moments when you're feeling closest to God are not just moments for you to enjoy for that moment. Those are moments for you to fall back on in a whole lot of future moments, to remember these moments. Um, turn with me to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. It's getting late early tonight. <laughs> Yogi Berra, right? There you go. All right. Okay, Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. Transfigured. He's going from his human figure to his glorious figure to show them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, which no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. Why Elijah and Moses? Why do you think those two? Moses always represents the law, Elijah the prophets, and you hear the Old Testament era called the law and the prophets. So this is pretty much saying, here's your whole Old Testament era here, up here with, with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here, and let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, because he didn't know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. Now it says they were greatly afraid, but what is he saying? He's saying... Why, what, what, is, what are three tabernacles going to do? It's saying we want to stay here, right? Let's shelter here. Let's not leave here. Why? Can you imagine seeing Jesus in his heavenly glory and Moses and Elijah? It's not likely you're going to go, I'm getting late. I think i got to get going here tonight, right? You're going to want to stay and stay and stay and stay and stay. Okay. So these are these moments. These are these celebration moments. These are the moments, listen, you're literally on the mountaintop. They're literally on the mountaintop with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. Where else do you, could you possibly want to be? And so Peter says, let's build three tabernacles uh, and let's stay here. Verse 7, and a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. Now think of it, cloud comes, overshadows them. They don't see Jesus, they don't see Moses, they don't see Elijah. They don't see each other. It's just cloud, what the heck's going on? Now a voice, this is my son, my beloved son, hear him. So now it's gonna be, when the cloud moves, only one of those three is gonna be standing, and that's the one we gotta listen to, right? Because remember, these are Jewish men. Who was Moses and Elijah to them? Everything, right? So what's God saying? I gotta get you off of the Moses and Elijah, Trip, I got to get you on to Jesus, right? So the cloud overshadows them. Moses and Elijah disappear. Jesus is standing alone. This is my beloved son. Hear them. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now let's go to verse 14. That's a mountaintop experience, correct? That is an amazing mountaintop experience. Maybe the single greatest one a human being ever experienced. <coughs> They want to stay. At least Peter's trying to get them to stay on the mountaintop with them, right? But what? why do we have to get off the mountain? Why can't you just experience that glory forever and ever and ever before you die? 
Well, watch, verse 14. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. In other words, the rest of the world's still happening, right? The rest of the world's still, still in the muck. Immediately when they saw him, all the people, the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one, one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever, it's, whenever, wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they couldn't. Now, what would a parent go through if their child's rendered moot? He gets seized, thrown to the ground, foaming at the mouth, gnashing his teeth, becoming rigid. It's a desperate situation, correct? It's a very desperate situation. They can't help him. So Jesus answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he was thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, death and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? Because he's only come out by prayer and fasting. Now, let me just ask you this. What would have happened to the father of this boy if, if Jesus allowed the mountaintop experience to last longer? He would have been tormented longer maybe for the rest of his life, right? Listen, when we bring the kids on missions trips, they always come back saying, let's never let this feeling in, let's never let this feeling in. And then I become Mr. Bad Guy, because I go, guys, it's gonna end. It's going to end, like in an hour. Or like it's almost gone already, okay? Get over it, why? Because you can't stay on the mountaintop and live by your feelings. Because you gotta get off the mountain, because what's off the mountain? Ministry where the hurting people are, okay? So if you wanna stay on your mountaintop experiences, you're canceling yourself out from being any good to anybody. You gotta come back down to reality and you've gotta remember these mountaintop experiences, these times you're very close to God, remember them, be motivated by them, but realize you're still gonna get down into a fallen world and then you're gonna to have to get your elbows dirty with the rest of the sinners of the world, right? Okay, <clears throat> can you imagine if Jesus said three tabernacles would be great, we'll spend a few days up here, there's gonna be tremendous suffering in this little boy, correct? Okay, so mountaintop experiences are great, but there's no fruit there. Where, where does fruit grow? Valleys. You gotta go back down into the valleys where the fruit is, and that's where you're gonna minister, and that's where you're gonna bear fruit. It's gonna be in the valleys. Now, if you'll allow me, I um, have another rabbit trail I'd like to go down because these are the things that help me so much that um, I hope will help you. But <clears throat> um, when, verse 24 says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with, him, said with tears, Lord, I believe. <laughs> Jesus says, listen, all things are possible to him who believes. He goes, I believe. And then he's like, but do I believe enough? Because my son's health is at stake. I wonder if I have the faith that's required to help this boy get healed right now. So what does he immediately say? Help my unbelief. Listen, don't you spend a lot of time there? Hey, you believe her? Yes. And then your breath is going, Lord, help my unbelief. Right? Doubts creep in, things happen. Listen, do you know Jesus actually tells us how to increase our faith? Did you know that? How to help your unbelief? Luke 17. Luke 17. Um... In Luke 17, Jesus said to his disciples, it's impossible that no sin should come, but woe to him through whom the sin comes. 
It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times a day, sorry, seven, day, seven times a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. What's that make the apostles say? Seven times a day, Lord, increase our faith. I don't know if I have the capacity to forgive somebody sinning against me seven times a day.